So we've been looking at the story of Moses and how God has been using Moses to act in the lives of his people, the Israelites. And so we've been following it through. And so I thought we'd kind of have a bit of a recap to where we've got to today, because we've gone quite quickly. And last week we were only at plague one, and now we're coming to plague 10. And it can be quite a devastating story. And there's lots of questions. But before we kind of think about that, let me just pray. Lord God, as we look at your word, we thank you for it. We thank you that it does speak to us. Lord, even stories that seem so far removed from our life, we can learn things from it. So help us to listen today, to hear you speaking to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so God is acting throughout the whole story of Moses. And so we're going to recap a little bit, because actually in the passage today, I don't know if you guys, when you hear a passage or you read the Bible, it might just be me, but sometimes you go, what? Anyone else done that ever? Yeah, thanks Andrew, you and I are together. Um, but yeah, sometimes we go, what? And I don't know if when you heard um, you and read that passage, if there was any kind of what questions you and did you have any what questions when you were preparing and reading it? No, you're sorted. Brilliant. We'll come to you later. Um, but sometimes we do. We have a what or why is that included and what's going on in the Bible and it doesn't make sense to me. So that's good. We can dig in and study and think more about what does that mean. And what does it mean for us? Because I'm not an Egyptian or an Israelite living way back in that time of the pharaohs and the kings of Egypt. But what does it mean for us today? God's acting then. Does God act in us today? Does he make a difference to our lives? Because he made a difference to the lives of his people in this story. Let's have a look at the pictures on the screen. So to remind us that in the story, Moses was in Egypt. All the Israelites were in Egypt and they were in slavery and they were being treated quite harshly by Pharaoh and his workers. And God had heard their cries. So they've been crying in slavery for 450 years. That's a long time to be crying out. But God acted at the perfect time in the history of his people. And then we get this encounter in the next picture where Moses encounters God in a burning bush. So with the next slide, we have Moses being given a message by God. And he says to, God says to Moses in the, in the burning bush, he says, go to Pharaoh and give this really simple message. Do we remember what the message was? Has anyone got an idea? What was the message that Pharaoh had said? Um, Moses was to say to Pharaoh, yes. Let my people go. I mean, it's not a difficult command, is it? It's quite simple, understandable. Let my people go. And yet, Pharaoh didn't. So we then get this account of Pharaoh hardening his heart and not listening to God. And Colin touched on this last week with the first plague of the blood. And actually, this response was as a response to the rebellion of Pharaoh's heart, that he didn't listen to God, didn't realize that God was the king of the whole world, bigger than Pharaoh himself. And so we get all these different plagues, which are a sign of God's judgment and wanting to bring out his people from slavery to freedom. So we get, what have we got on the screen here? Yeah, I mean, the words are there, but... Yeah, so we have first the plague of the blood, and then the frogs. Then the next picture, we have the plague of gnats and flies. I mean, who gets freaked out by the thought of that? I do, yeah, thank you. I, uh, when, when I grew up, my mum's um, bedroom, we lived in a bungalow down in Folkestone, and my mum's bedroom was an infestation of flying ants. Does everyone know what flying ants are? It's horrible. And in some of the really hot summers we had, you would walk in, and her window was black because it was just covered in these flying ants. I mean, it's enough to make your skin crawl. Sorry if you're all sitting there now going, Ugh. but it's horrible, isn't it? We don't like insects or one or two flies and I'm swatting at them. But this was an infestation and it totally destroyed um, the sort of Egypt and it kind of stopped everything from happening. In the other plagues, things were destroyed, crops were destroyed, animals died because the next plagues we had plagues of the livestock and boils. Imagine having uncomfortable boils all over your bodies. And there was a distinction in some of these between the Egyptians and the Israelites. And some of them affected everything and everyone, and some, the Israelites, were protected. After the plague of the livestock and boils, we get plague of hail. 
I'm not quite sure why this picture is fire, but anyway, maybe it's because of the speed of travel. Um, but there was plague of hail, then there was the plague of locusts, so they swarmed and destroyed all of the crops and everything that was growing in the land of Egypt. And then we get the plague of darkness. And then we get to this point in the story where God is acting in our passage today. And he predicts, tells Moses to go and tell Pharaoh that there's going to be one final plague. And I think in our passage today, it helps us to think about God acting in this specific way. And there's kind of four ways he acts. He acts to cause Pharaoh to completely drive out God's people from Egypt. And in verse 1, it sort of says, it's not just a he'll let them go, but he's going to drive them out. There's going to be no, it's not going to be like, oh, nice to have you been our slaves for a while and farewell. It's going to be completely driven out. There was going to be such animosity and anger and devastation that they were going to be thrown out of the country. And in verse 8, it talks about how God said that eventually Pharaoh's leaders, um, his helpers will come to you, Moses, and they'll fall down at your feet. Can anyone do a good impression of falling down at someone's feet? You kind of, yeah, you go on, right? Yeah, so it's that kind of position of complete surrender, of humility, of humbling. So he's saying that all these officials are going to humble themselves before Pharaoh, and no, not before Pharaoh, before Moses, and that they are going to beg Moses and the Israelites to leave. So God acts in that way by hardening Pharaoh's heart and getting to a point where he's willingly letting them go. God acts in this story by giving favour to God's people. So we get in verse 2 and verse 3 where God says to Moses, tell them to go to their neighbours and take gold, silver, jewels, really nice things. Has anyone tried that with their neighbours? <laughs> Do you think around have some gold silver but actually in this specific case i'm not saying do that please don't please don't take me at that word but in this situation god had said to moses do this and they were seen favorably and it's a really interesting notion and idea that actually the words and the the stuff that god was to they were to take is kind of reminiscent of a bride the things that a bride would be given as she left her father's house to then go to a new family. And the Bible's full of language about us being God's bride, about the church being the bride of Jesus, and that sense of we're being given stuff to live that free life with Jesus for always. So there's a bit of symbolism there where the kind of Israelites were given all this stuff in order to flee and be prosperous in a new life in a new land then in this passage we also see god acting in judgment and it's a horrible story it's horrible judgment where all the firstborn are killed and die but it also shows that god protects his israelites too in all of that tragedy the passage talks about how they'll be wailing and mourning i lived in a country where the mourning tradition um, was that when someone died, you mourned for 40 days and you hired professionals to come in and cry and act as wailers and grievers as part of the process. can seem utterly desperate, but it's that outpouring of grief, a visible, audible outpouring of grief. And that's what God's saying, that his judgment is final and complete. And it's horrible and tragic that he makes a way for salvation and redemption. And there's also hints that actually in the Exodus, when the Israelites leave Egypt, that actually some Egyptians go too. His God's redemption and freedom can be wider now. And we know that from Jesus, but we'll do more of that in a bit. And actually God acts in this. He does all these signs and miracles and all these plagues to show that he is God of the universe, that he's bigger than Pharaoh. But what does that mean for us? That's a story that happened long ago. And we see clearly in the passage that God acts to cause Pharaoh to drive his people out, to give favour to his people, to bring judgment and to make himself known. But in our next slide, I wonder what then happened next? 
We've got this terrible kind of prediction of what's going to happen. But what did happen next? Well, before we get to next week's Bible passage, a lot of things happen. Because God says, I'm going to save you. Do we know how God saved the Israelites? Why, when the Egyptians were going to be wailing and screaming and grieving, that in the Israelite camp, not even a dog's snarl could have been heard, it says in our passage. Any idea? Well, the next picture will show you, and have you got an idea? Yeah, they, they did. So, if we look at the next slide, they took a lamb. Moses was told to tell his people to take a lamb and to take the blood, and in the next picture, put the blood on the doors. And that they were together in family groups, and if the family was small, together with other people. And they were to sit and have a meal together, and they were to eat the lamb and give thanks to God for his saving grace. And that, that night, the angel of death would pass over them. That whoever had the blood painted on his door, they'd be knowing that they were God's people. And their firstborns wouldn't die. And so that happened. They painted the blood, they had this meal. The tragic event happened. And there was mourning and grieving in Egypt, as we see in the next slide. Utter devastation and tragedy. But because of the consequence of them rebelling against God. And then Pharaoh gets to the point where he does send them out and says, go, leave, flee. So then we'll pick up more from next week. But the question um, that I have at the end of all this kind of catch-up is, or this kind of statement, is that God's actions made a difference to the lives of the Israelites. Before they were in slavery, they were beaten, they were oppressed, they were told that they couldn't, um, their, ch- so their children were killed. And then God brought them out of that. He heard their cry and he brought them through to the other side. Our God is a big God. He's a great big God and he has actions in our lives too. So we kind of saw how God acted in the life of Moses and the Israelites and he made a difference to their lives from slavery to freedom. But how about for us? As we look at the next slide, maybe we want to question and think, what difference does God make to our lives, how is he at work? To help us, we're going to use a bit of an illustration. So, who has heard of gravity? Hopefully we've all heard of it. If we look at our next slide. So, gravity exists, yeah? We all kind of believe that, know that. We don't always think about it. So, gravity exists because I'm standing here and not floating away, although that would be fun. <laughs> But gravity exists. When we got up this morning, we got up and sat up with the help of gravity. Gravity was at work that allowed us to not kind of fling up right, um, not fly off into the atmosphere. When we were pouring our cereal and our milk, it's gravity that meant that it wasn't going to go up on the ceiling. We'd have to like quickly maneuver the bowl to catch it. (laughs) Gravity is at work. But we're not always aware that it is at work around us. God's gifted us with gravity. God created gravity so that we could be living beings here on earth. This is a picture of Isaac Newton. He was the guy that sat under an apple tree, allegedly had an apple fall on his head and realised that gravity existed, that objects are being drawn down, downwards to the centre of the earth. And he called it a mysterious action at a distance. A mysterious action, a distance, is what he coined the phrase gravity. And sometimes gravity goes a bit wrong, maybe. Or we're not really aware of it, we don't think about it until something interesting happens or gravity is taken away. Has anyone seen those kind of simulations where you simulate being in space and your kind of gravity taken out of the equation when we see them in the space stations and things, they're floating around. All sorts of things don't go where they're supposed to, downwards. Gravity is taken out of the picture and it changes everything. But we're not really conscious of it until it's gone. We don't realise what gravity does until it's removed from the equation. Rachel, would you be my mic stand? In the story, the um, Israelites, they put the blood on the door. And in the case of us, Jesus' blood is what redeems us. What means that Jesus' act on the cross means we can know God's redeeming love. Now, if I open this bottle, if I can, when we pour water out, it just pulls out, doesn't it? That's what happens to water. 
Gosh, I put it on so tight. I was carrying it over from St. George's and I thought, I'll oh, better not make sure that doesn't pour out of my car. So we've got the water and what should happen is that when I turn it upside down, all the water is going to come out, right? We agree? That's how gravity works. Hopefully. This is upside down. We've got one or two drips, but it's not acting, is it, how we would expect it to act. We would expect that we pour it like that and water would gush out. Gravity isn't behaving as we expect. It's a surprise and so we take notice, well what has happened there? Why is gravity not doing what it should do? Sometimes in our lives we might think and not be aware that God's at work in our lives. We might not realise he is there, that he's created us, that he's sent Jesus for us that his blood would be able to wipe away our sin, our wrongdoing, that he would make a way for us to be reconnected with God, loved, loved in a loving relationship, that we would know and acknowledge that. See, gravity normally works and water would gush out. God is always at work, but sometimes we're just not totally aware of it. But if we pause and stop and reflect, we might see how God is at work. I can probably tell numerous stories in my life, you might not believe it, but when I was younger, I was really shy, like painfully shy. Like you would, I wonder if some of my teachers saw me and they would think, gosh, what's happened to Claire? Well, well God has changed my life and he's given me the strength to stand up. When I first came here two years ago actually now, um, nearly, um, my legs would be shaking the whole time. Nerves, and, and I still get nervous, I have to admit. It doesn't completely take that away. But actually, God gives us the strength to face all things, our difficulties in life. We're faced with all sorts of things in life as we grow up, and difficulties at school, or in our families, in work situations, with our health, finances. But God still is acting. The God that acted in the lives of the Israelites and brought them out of slavery into freedom is the same God that can act in our lives. Through the blood of Jesus, we can have a relationship with God. So on to our next slide, as we think about that, if we stop to reflect, where can we see God making a difference in our lives? Where has he made a difference? Where is he making a difference? And where would we like him to make a difference? Because what did the people in Egypt do? What did the Israelites do to God? They were in this terrible position. Yeah. Yeah, they prayed to him. They cried out to him. They cried out in anguish at the things that were going on. And God heard them. And we can do that too. If we go on to the next one, we can cry out to him and he will act. And that, I think, is the promise of this passage, that his people cried out to him in Egypt in slavery. And he brought them out of that. In our lives, we've got all sorts of things going on that we probably aren't even aware about of half of the stuff that goes on in our lives. But God does. He is a God that loves us, that wants to be in a relationship with us, which we can through the blood of Jesus. And we can know him when we cry out to him and he will act. So let's pray before we carry on with our service together. Lord God, we thank you that you are a God who acts, that loves us and cares for us that you can and do make a difference to our lives. Help us, Lord, to examine and to think where you're making a difference and help us as we continue walking with you to know your power at work in our lives, giving us strength when we feel weak and being our friend and saviour. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.